The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of this podcast do not represent those of their employers, any associated entities or organizations, past, present or future. The conveyed information is the personal interpretation of legal concepts and topics, provided for general consumption and should not be construed as legal advice. For specific guidance, seek the direction of a law professional in your area. Enjoy! Welcome to the podcast, Loose Interpretation. I am your host, Rob Tudeberg, and normally uh, these episodes consist of uh, breakdowns of the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution. I want to move eventually into some state laws and applications, but we have something a little different for you with this episode. I was able uh, to sit down and speak with Josh Breger, and we had a very candid conversation about a topic uh, that's very close to him, that being bail reform. Uh, now, every state being sovereign in the United States in terms of their individual criminal statutes uh, has a different take or view on bail and bond uh, legislation. For instance, um, bail being the uh, monetary amount or at least a, a promissory amount of money or uh, promised money um, funds that one must post to the court to be released once they have been arrested and brought before a judge. The vast majority of crimes in the state of Wisconsin, if people are uh, arrested uh, and then booked and released, are released on a what we would call a signature bond. Signature bond is nothing more than a document you would sign uh, in which you would promise to pay X amount of dollars to the court should you fail to comply with any of your bond conditions. And those bond conditions uh, can be anything set by the judge, but always include, uh, at least in Wisconsin, always include the conditions that you return to court for your next court date, you update your address with the court within 72 hours of moving, you cannot uh, do not commit any additional crimes. Uh, these are all pretty standard conditions, and again, judges have the right to impose uh, other conditions, uh, no alcohol, no drugs, no contact with anyone, no physical or verbal abuse, uh, etc. And so in Wisconsin, the most common type of, of release from court is under the conditions of a signature bond, um, or sometimes that's called on your own recognizance. Uh, there's different names and different variations throughout different states, but that's the general premise. A cash bond comes into effect uh, wherein you would commit a more serious offense or there would be questions as to whether or not uh, you are a danger to the, to the community or would be a possibility that you would not, or there could be the possibility that you would not return to court. Uh, therefore, the judge would have a um, the option to uh, uh, impose a cash bond. It can be whatever um, is agreed upon by the, the court. The defense, or the, a, a defense attorney would argue this with a client or with someone being charged with the crime, or I'm sorry, at least arrested with the crime, uh, and the prosecution or the state has the option to argue for a higher or lower cash bond, whatever the situation uh, would entail. Everything being um, really independent or dependent upon the individual situation. So uh, the, the, the movement recently in the United States has been towards or there has been some talk and, and movement towards elimination of cash bond. Uh, one of the main premises being is that this unfairly or unfairly imposes uh, uh, hardships upon those who are not uh, as wealthy as others, those who may fall below a certain socioeconomic status uh, or just don't have the, the physical means, uh, don't have the availability to post a cash bond and therefore, uh, the law is unfairly applied to those who do have the ability fiscally versus those who do not. Um, again, this goes back to the concept of due process, uh, equal protection under the law. Um, however, those who, who would, would challenge a change to the uh, cash bond system uh, would argue that, that these are individually dependent upon uh, specific circumstances. Uh, perhaps uh, someone who does not have as much financial means, if they were to commit a specific crime, the judge may give them a lower cash bond 
compared to someone who has uh, more uh, fiscal ability to pay, they may get a higher cash bond. So again, there's no set standard. Uh, it's just all dependent upon the individual situation and what a judge deems most appropriate. So um, without giving away what we're going to be discussing, I want you to listen to this interview uh, with uh, Chief Brager, and you're going to see why he's so passionate about bail reform, why he believes this is not a good idea, specifically in his state, the state of Texas. And um, sadly enough, it's got some political motivations behind it. So sit back, enjoy the interview with Chief Berger. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, again, our email here is looselaws at gmail.com. That's looselaws at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. We're always interested in your feedback and uh, taking the show in any direction uh, that you, the listener, would really like to learn more about. So with no further ado, here's the interview. So I have the opportunity today uh, to speak with Pasadena, Texas Police Chief Josh Berger uh, about um, some uh, developments, some some legal issues uh, affecting not only the state of Texas, but his home municipality, uh, but also nationwide. And uh, these are some trends that we're seeing um, in, in the form of legal reforms, uh, bills being passed at state level. And obviously uh, what I'm talking about here is bail bond reform, uh, Chief. Uh, so for the people here listening who are maybe not familiar with that law or with those laws or with the laws of Texas and Wisconsin where I am, can you give us just a brief overview uh, of what a, a your your bail bond reform or your bail bond laws currently stand at right now. What when are they issued? What is bond? What do people need to know about this first as a baseline? So how our started, we we actually they couldn't get it through the legislature, so it ended up coming through um, some federal law and, and a federal judge and essentially an agreed to uh, uh, lawsuit settlement is how we ended up with misdemeanor bail reform and. The long story short is, with the exception of very few cases, mm -hmm. uh, folks are granted to be presumed to be eligible for a PR bond or a personal recognizance bond. And a couple of the uh, exceptions to that are family violence cases, uh, misdemeanor family violence, mm -hmm. um, uh, your second uh, driving while intoxicated offense. Um, if you are already out on a PR bond or you're already out on probation, those are the general exceptions per se, but then they turn around at the very end and then say, but it's also up to the judge that they can turn around and give you another PR bond. So um, in practice, you're actually seeing um, it being applied to a lot more than what it originally was intended to be applied to. Um, and, and so that's the basic gist of it, um, how it started on the misdemeanor side. And now we're starting to see some of it uh, being applied to the felony side as well. And that really was you know, my introduction to, to bail reform because you know, being a police chief, bail wasn't necessarily my... Uh, my lane, if you will, and um, when it started to impact uh, public safety, um, that's when I became involved. Okay, so in, in Wisconsin here, just as a point of reference, we have uh, signature bonds and we have cash bonds typically. So our signature bonds would be similar to your personal recognizance bond in that the the suspect, the defendant at the time, doesn't have to post any specific amount of cash. Basically, it's a promissory note saying that if I violate my bond conditions, if I fail to appear for court, I'm going to promise to pay the court 500, 1,000, whatever it is. I'm assuming that's pretty similar to your personal recognizance bond. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Okay. And then obviously cash bond being cash bond, you have to post that specific amount. Does the state of Texas have like a 10% rule or something where you have to post a significant portion of that bond to be released? Um, it's not an actual law, but it, as a practice, it's generally um, about 10% um, okay. on the cash bail side of things. Okay, and so that's where we would differ. Ours is 100%. If you get a 10,000 cash bond, you put up 10,000 cash. So laws differ state to state, um, but, but generally bonds work the same way. Um, let's talk about, before we get into these actual instances, so tell me about this the city of Pasadena. Where in Texas is it located? Let's put some, let's flesh out the kind of the, the situation so people have a better appreciation as to uh, where we're coming from. Tell me about Pasadena, Pasadena, Texas. So we have a, a population of about 165,000 people. We are a suburb of Houston on the, we share a common border, the southeast side of Houston. 
Um, we both uh, lie within Harris County, um, so we're both in the same county, Houston and Pasadena. Um, we have a sworn force of just under 300 right now, um, a civilian of about 100, so all total about 400 employees um, with a department, so that's basic overview of it. Okay, um, and and overall, nice area to live. You must be uh, golf side, uh, golf coast side of Texas. Um, vacation spot, not vacation spot. Not vacation spot. About thirty miles south of here, um, down okay. on the actual to the beach to Galveston. Okay, um, and, and so very blue collar town, um, if okay. you will. We have one of the largest refinery uh, complexes in the nation, um, okay. and so uh, the ship channel runs through here. So we have a lot of industry as well. Okay, good. So obviously there, there is an issue with bail and bail, bail bond reform uh, that we need to speak about today. Can you tell me what happened to get you involved uh, in this matter? So I was appointed police chief January 2nd, uh, 2019, so almost two years ago. So I had been the police chief about three weeks um, when I had a line of officers um, outside my door upset and um trying to figure out here I'm the new chief, you know, what's going on? What did I already do? And um, what had happened, we had um, an individual, he robbed uh, a CVS and a Walgreens uh, one night in early January. Um, and he had a Halloween mask on, so he got away. Um, we were unable to identify him. And so uh, about almost two weeks later, um, he did the same thing again. And, and let me point out, the first time he did it, he had uh, shot at a witness. And so it was a pretty serious offense. Um, you know, brandishing gun both times. And so the second time, um, after he did the first one, about 20 minutes later, he did the second one. But our folks were, um, they, they suspected it might be a pattern. So they started sitting up around the stores and he came running out with a gun in one hand, money in the other, and turned pointing the gun toward the officer as he was running. Um, he was struck with a patrol car. Anyway, we arrested him. Okay. So that night he was charged with uh, four counts of aggravated robbery and one count of aggravated assault on a police officer, which are all first degree felonies here. We can get up to 99 years. Um, yeah. on each offense and um, after he got arrested um, turns out between our series of crimes he had been arrested by another agency uh, for unlawfully possessing a firearm and he had gotten a PR bond on that so we were arresting um, for these felony offenses he's already out on the PR bond and the judge gives him uh, five PR bonds for these first degree felonies and so needless to say you know the officers were upset here they are risking their lives out here you know trying to you know catch bad guys and, and keep folks safe and the guy you know the next day is out of jail on a signature and so um that was really my wake up call to bail reform if you will and what was going on so is it is it normal for officers to come to you with these type of issues i'm assuming that you must handle hundreds of thousands of calls for service every year with your department and then being bordering houston you're a busy busy agency uh, a, a metro area is it normal for officers to come to you with these type of concerns no not like this. And like I said, they, there was outrage. And, and, you know, my biggest thing at that point was, you know, I, I made a Facebook video. And honestly, at the time, my thought process was really to show the men and women of the department that are out there that I supported them and I would stand up for them when it was appropriate. And so I did that. And when I did it, I say it went viral. That might be a little much, but um, it gained a lot of traction. And so I had folks reaching out to me, really educating me on bail reform and the impact that it could have. And that that was my introduction and really how I got involved. Okay. That that speaks to the, the quality of officers that you have when, when you have them that, that care enough to come to you and say, hey, we can't directly affect the, the bond, the bail that's being given to these people, but maybe you can. And so they care. And I think that's critical in any type of, of agency, specifically in law enforcement. Um, what a, what other uh, is there other instances or other situations and that that this this bail this P, these PR bonds um, have been I guess wrongfully in my opinion and I can say that being an outsider wrongfully applied to to people who have been accused of crimes. Yes, so that happened in January and I became a pretty outspoken um, opponent of s some of the bail reform and so. Um, it was uh, in July of 2019. It was a Saturday. I remember, you know, very clearly where I was at. And I got a call from our uh, uh, sergeant over um, our violent crimes, investigates homicides. And he called me and he said, Chief, you're not going to believe this. And I said, try me. And uh, he said, well, there's a guy that our department arrested a couple days ago for uh, assault family violence on his wife. Um, he got a PR bond 
and got out and um, went back to the apartment and stabbed her and she was pregnant and killed her and um, their unborn child and you know it turned out he had been arrested by the Houston Police Department in May um, for uh, his second driving while intoxicated offense and failing to stop at the scene of an accident and um, he was given PR bonds on both of those um, about six weeks later he commits this uh, assault family member offense um, get the PR bond for that so now we have a guy that just getting PR bond after PR bond and then you know goes over there and, and it, tragic case and kills her and I, I, honestly I believe it could have been possibly prevented um, mm-hmm. you know of course I'll never know but um, you know one of the things you know with the you know the downside to a PR bond especially on the family violence type cases you don't have that cooling off period if they're you know released as soon as they're you know at the jail and, and signed saying they're going to appear that you lose that cooling off yeah. You know, would it make a difference here? I know that we should have given her a chance. So it it's this person is, is out on bond, released on his own recognizance for an OWI second, which is criminal, right? Criminal yes. charge. And not just an OWI. It wasn't like this person was driving over the center line, was stopped. Uh, this was a, a crash involving this person, he, and he fled. Am I right on that? Fled the scene? Yes. yes. Okay. Gets released. Uh, weeks what maybe months weeks later is involved in a domestic disturbance with his wife who was pregnant uh and i believe in that instance he killed the family cat is that that's that's correct okay. yes. so we show a propensity towards violence here uh i can tell you that in the county that i that i worked in or have worked in in law enforcement for 20 years um it's a mandatory bond condition that they not have contact with the victim and the state of Wisconsin does give the victim the opportunity to enforce a 72-hour no-contact enforcement. Sometimes they take that, sometimes they don't. But regardless, our county, Chippewa County, has said no contact as a bond condition regardless. Uh, but in this case, this, this, this person is released, again, on another personal recognizance bond. And then a matter of days later, uh, days or weeks later, had to about out, back, 18 hours later. 18 hours. Forward. 18 hours yeah stabs her and not uh, only her she was four months pregnant at the time with his child um, exactly why why the push for these personal recognizance bonds in situations where they clearly don't fit I wish I had the answer to that but it, it originally it, the intent of bail reform particularly on the misdemeanor side was to keep people from languishing in jail on low-level offenses. Uh, you know, a, a personal use of you know, marijuana amount, um, uh, you know, driver's license infractions, things like that, that they're not sitting in jail, which, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, I, you know, I support, you know, in limited cir- circumstances, those cases with PR bonds. But um, at the point that we're now, you know, violent offenses, felonies, weapons offenses, um, I, I that's where I take the exception. And, and you know, I, I get out in the community a lot. And one thing I find, it doesn't matter whether I'm in, you know, uh, you know, an affluent community, not so affluent, white, black, you know, whatever the case is, most people seem to be appalled by this. And I think that's the troubling part to me is, you know, again, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic, your race, all those things. People want to be safe in their communities. Just fly in the face of that many it's 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 one of those situations where no matter where you come from culturally racial whatever we all want to be safe I mean that's just a basic human need and if we're and I don't think anyone's going to disagree with you especially nowadays when we're seeing the push towards uh, legalization or at least decriminalization of of marijuana uh, maybe other drugs that those may be the simple possession cases are what this personal recognizance bond is for like you said the low-level offender, maybe the first-time offender, people that don't need to be sitting in jail because they're not a danger to the community or they haven't had prior instances of failure to appear. But yet it's not only Texas and in particular your uh, jurisdiction that's seeing this. We're also seeing this at a national level. Uh, the state of New York uh, in the last couple months has in, in, in enacted similar legislation that's led to a significant amount of recidivism to people who are on bond conditions. 80 plus percent of people who are being released are reported to commit additional crimes. Um, You're hearing from people who are appalled by this, who are shocked by this, who don't understand this. What do we do? What's the next step? 
So I think this is, you know, we had an election yesterday, a big election, but this is where, you know, folks have got to get educated on the issues. And, you know, I think the sad might be a strong word, but um, after this had happened, I was out in the community at several homeowner groups and I was talking and they were, chief, what do we need to do about this? And the frustrating thing to me is people just don't understand the issues, right? I mean, they, they don't understand the criminal justice system oftentimes. And so they don't understand bail. They don't understand that the judges, you know, are dictating this and it, and in Texas, um, you know, our judges are elected, and uh, they're partisan, actually, here. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what I told them, you have to vote. I mean, that, that's, if you want to make change, you know, here, you have to vote. And so, you know, that's what I try to tell people, you know, educate yourself on the topics. And, you know, law enforcement even oftentimes doesn't understand it. Um, you know, the, the district attorney here in Harris County, she and I oftentimes do not agree on issues, but this is one issue that she and I do agree on. But I say that to say she and I will be in a room and I'll have cops coming up to me like, oh, y'all are in the same room. I can't believe, you, you know, and I'm like, she's on the same side. But they're thinking the DA's office is the one setting bail. I'm like, it's not, you know, you may be mad at her on other issues, but this is not the one to be, you know, upset with her. And so when I, I say that, because if cops don't get it and work in the system, then, you know, the general public oftentimes doesn't get it. So that it's the biggest thing is educate yourself and vote. I think that's a really good point. And then that's where this this broadcast, I think, is really one of the core tenets is to help educate people who don't have that appreciation or familiarity with this system. Um, it, it, I think it's a lack of understanding. And, and we as humans tend to assume the negative. And so maybe that is, and I'd hate to take this into the realm of the negative, um, negative perception we're seeing of law enforcement lately. But I think some of that, whatever portion, I don't know, can be chalked up to not understanding. And so if people had a better understanding of what police procedure was, case law, the scope of law enforcement authority, these type of issues, I think there would be better understanding. You're exactly right. Get out and educate yourself, get out and vote. But then us on the law enforcement side, it's incumbent upon us to also share this information with people and, and let them know that these source, resources are available to educate them on this. You have judges uh, who are partisan uh, in, in your jurisdiction that, that take these issues up, how much, or t that, that lean one way or the other, how much of this do you think is political, is not political, um, and what can be done about that other than, than voting? So I will tell you, I think a lot of it is political. And so in January of 2018, um, Harris County um, went completely blue for the first time. Um, and so none of the judges on the bench were, uh, they were all Democrat um, from January on. And so you started to see um, really an aggressive push after that um, for, for some of these changes. And I try to leave the politics out of this, but unfortunately it, uh, it intertwines itself into it sometimes. And, you know, I tell the story because the, the judge that released the aggravated robber um, on all the PR bonds, I was down there on another case where he was going to release somebody on a PR bond. And so the DA's office asked me if I would come down there and be present um, to maybe sway him to do the opposite. Anyway, I got called to the bench and he and I had a, had a uh, friendly conversation to respect each other's opinion. However, um, one thing he said from the bench was he was doing what the party wanted him to do. And um, you know, that, that was frustrating to me. That in open court, other people heard that. Um, my officers were there with me, and they said, he really just said that. Um, and that's exactly what he said. And so, um, you know, back to what you can do. It's educate yourself on the issue. Um, you know, the other thing that frustrates me is this has been tried in New Jersey, Alaska, New Mexico, and um, it seems like everybody that's tried it's got buyer's remorse um, at some point. And, um, you know, study history, you know, open the book, even if it's recent history, and, and see how it's worked in other places before you jump in. Because I think um, oftentimes we don't look at the, I say we, you know, legislatures, all of us from time to time don't look at the unintended consequences of, of some of these decisions. And I think, you know, unfortunately we're seeing some of those consequences. When you, when you mentioned legislature, um, have you had any contact with state legislature, local representation? Uh, has there any been any movement towards uh, in the statewide as, as far as, as legislation? So, yes. Um, and in the last, so our legislature meets every other year in the odd years. Um, and so the last legislative session was really when this talk of bail reform really started getting discussed here in Texas. Um, it ended up dying in the legislature, of any legislation. And so, um, this next legislative session that begins in January, um, there are already bills filed 
um, to try to address some of these uh, disparities that are across the state. Because in the big cities here, San Antonio, Houston, Austin, Dallas, um, you see more of the push toward the reform and the more rural counties, the suburban counties, um, completely different. And so trying to get everybody on the same page. I know the, the mother of our, our homicide victim that I told you about, the pregnant one, um, she has been a very uh, outspoken um, opponent of bail, uh, PR bonds, and she's actually trying to get uh, legislation passed here, Caitlin's Law, and that's going to deal with folks that are already out on a PR bond uh, by state law will not be eligible for another PR bond. So that's a start. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And again, like you said, and I agree, you, you hate to drag politics into policing because at the core, we are here to help people. We're here to protect the community. Um, but Texas is a red state. And even though you might be trending a little bit purple, <laughs> um, it is a red state as it stands right now. And so I'm assuming your legislature is pretty conservative as well. Um, you would think that would have a good chance at, at becoming law at some point in the future. Yeah, so I'm pretty optimistic this next legislative, legislative session they will fix some of this, I hope. Good. Now, um, an opponent, someone uh, contrary uh, to, to, to what we're talking about that would be pro-bail reform, would, and I'll play devil's advocate, they could make the argument that bail punishes those who are not of a certain um, financial status, that those who are not as well off don't have the opportunity to, to post bond. Therefore, um, states like in, you've mentioned some states, but California and New York have talked about eliminating bail bond across the board. Therefore, you're either in jail or you're not. How would you respond to someone that, that says uh, bail in, in, uh, unfairly targets persons who don't have the, the, the economic ability to post bond like someone of a wealthier status would? So my response to that would be, I think it, at that point, if you cannot post bail, if, it, if you, there is a bail set for you and you can't post it, I think that's where there has to be an individualized assessment of the person because, um, you know, five thousand dollar you know bail to me you know i might be able to make whereas somebody else might not be able to whereas you know the ceo of a large company five thousand dollars is chunk change and so i do think it has to be individualized at a certain point and you know the one thing i think you know that we lose by getting rid of a complete cash bail system is i think there's another layer of accountability that people don't often see is you know i'll take the you know the 18 year old kid that gets arrested for a low level amount of, of marijuana for ages here in Harris County, that would be a $500 bail the first time. And so you go to a bail bondsman, you know, $50 and, and get your 18 year old, you know, child out of jail, which is what happened most of the time. And, you know, you go $50. Okay. But the thing with that is you can bet that if mom or dad came down there and put bail up or your spouse or your friend or whoever it is, that's going to be another layer of oversight to make sure you get back to court because my name is on the line, not just yours. And so I think people have, lost sight of that extra layer of accountability many times and you know domestic violence for example you know if somebody comes and gets you out of jail maybe they take you to their house to you know to cool off if they posted your bail and so i think that there is uh, you know that extra layer but i also think you know to answer your original question is you know if somebody can't make a bail after a certain you know maybe it's 48 hours 72 hours that there needs to be an individualized assessment of that person's financial uh, situation to see that Okay, maybe they can only make a fifty dollar bill. Maybe that takes everything they have, but they have still put something up, and they still have skin in the game. And and, and then I think that's a really good point because when we talk about sentencing, sentencing is very personalized to the situation and the individual as well. Um, granted, bail you are not been found guilty yet. But you're just simply we're talking about release from from custody. But uh, oftentimes you hear people complain, "Well, this person committed this crime and they got this sentence versus this crime and they did not get this sentence." When I, again, this goes back to the lack of understanding. Sentencing itself is very personalized to the crime, to the to the person, to their past history, to their acceptance of responsibility. Um, these are all things that, again, this is where our personalization, like you'd mentioned, uh, comes down to um, uh, the individual. What would you say to someone? Make a sales pitch to to anyone listening to this as to why we need to have this type of of system in place as far as accountability with these personal recognizance bonds. What, what's your final sales pitch on this? My final sales pitch should be, you know, the, the cases that I've told you about and, you know, the violence and the, and the, the danger, the public safety danger, that these folks are back out on the streets with, um, you know, no accountability. I say no accountability, but they, they really have gotten out on the signature. And so 
that they are not vested per se in, um, you know, having an incentive to return to court. And so I'll tell you this, um, when they were doing the trial period on the misdemeanor bail side, um, on the PR bonds and they had implemented before there was agreement, um, in federal court, 40% of the people on PR bonds did not show back up to court. 40%. So that's almost half. Whereas if you look at the cash bail side, it was less than 10% that were failing to appear. And so that would be my sales pitch. And then on the law enforcement side, at some point, somebody's going to have to go find these people and that's going to be us. And so, you know, then obviously there's an inherent danger with going out and having to serve warrants and pick people back up a second time. So um, the the danger of the community, the danger to law enforcement, um, that really is unnecessary. Um, That's, that would be my sales pitch. Seems completely avoidable. Um, were different decisions made throughout the process of, of pros- criminal prosecution. Absolutely. Right. Um, you know, this is, this is one of those situations where you, I think you're doing uh, yeoman's work by stepping in and before something tragic happens, unfortunately we did have, or you had more than I obviously in your uh, community, something happened tragically. Um, and, and, but if, if we can head this off, uh, it, it, it would make it that much better for everyone else because we don't know what potentially could happen down the line. What drives you to do this? Why, why are you doing this? Why, you, why do you care so much about this? I care about the safety of the community. I mean, that's the oath I took was, you know, especially being the, you know, the chief, I, you know, uh, I have an obligation to keep, you know, the people in Pasadena safe. And um, I think this goes along to it. And the other thing is, um, you know, to support the men and women that, that work here and do the good work every day. Um, and they do it not for the accolades, but they do it because it's the right thing to do. And it's, you know, and they're passionate and they, they want to help the community. And so this really goes in line with that because um, anything we can do to, to help protect the public is, you know, that's what it's all about. Absolutely right. Uh, Chief, I appreciate the time that, that you've taken to speak with me today. Uh, this is a great issue. And I hope that by talking and putting this information out there, more people become educated, more people uh, become aware, and we certainly move this needle in the right direction. Thank you again for all your time. Yep. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. My thanks to Chief Berger for his uh, time and the information he shared uh, with me and subsequently with you, you can see that bail reform uh, is not as clear cut of an issue as uh, some would make it seem to be. This is one of those uh, public policy issues that may appear fair and just on the surface, but has deeper, uh, possibly unintended consequences the more thoroughly it's examined. Uh, again, in the state of Wisconsin, we do things uh, differently than possibly other states. Every state has their own specific laws and statutes governing this. Specifically, Chapter 969 um, covers the, the, the laws or addresses the laws um, of taking bail money in the state of Wisconsin. And then uh, 946, uh, Chapter 946 um, addresses the law or contains a law of bail jumping, which would be a violation of any bond conditions set by a judge. Um, I encourage you to look at this. If you'd like more information into this topic, um, you know, it's cities like Chicago and cities like New York uh, that are enacting these bail reform policies uh, that arguably have led to a rise in criminal statute or criminal activity. Uh, We see this happening in the larger cities to begin with. Uh, More populated cities have higher crime rates. And subsequently, now we have, uh, with bail reform, persons being released <clears throat> without any type of condition, um, again, committing acts of crime. A simple search on the internet will reveal numerous stories indicating uh, bail reform and its issues, specifically in these larger cities. So um, let me know what you think. Tell me tell me, uh, tell me, me your opinion. Give me your thoughts. Ask me your questions. Again, you can contact us at looselaws at gmail.com. That's looselaws at gmail.com. This is Rob Tudorberg, and this has been Loose Interpretation. This has been an episode of Loose Interpretation with Rob Tudorberg. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe wherever podcasts are available, including Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Leave us a review and send us any questions or comments to looselaws at gmail.com. That's L-O-O-S-E-L-A-W-S at gmail.com.